Questions or comments, uh, all welcome. And we'll take three, four, five, uh, and then we'll come back to the panel and, and, and we'll go around as many times as we have, have time for. So we'll go from, if, do you have a microphone? We'll go from left to right. And you need to stick your hands up thoroughly, otherwise I won't see them, okay. Hi, um, uh, Ilmi Granoff, a senior research fellow uh, here at ODI on, on green growth. Um, the idea of uh, being adaptive, to me is another, is a euphemistic way of saying accepting failure. Um, in order to be realistic about complex systems and view them um, with uh, a more statistical mind about outcomes, um, one would have to accept a much higher rate of failure. And our, I'd, I'd like to ask you to comment on how our institutions may be set up in a way to accept uh, a rate of failure much higher than they do now. I, I think a lot of our development speak is about avoiding um, confronting failure as part of the system. Very good, then uh, Rick had his hand up. Uh, yep, it's working. Rick Davies, Evaluation Consultant based in Cambridge. Um, I was interested in this issue of these uh, uh, sort of prevailing uh, simplicities and cognitive biases that Ben introduced at the beginning and asking myself, why does this happen? Why, have they why do they persist? And I think it may be useful to think of these and the causes of these in terms of something which you might call the economy of cognition or the economy of communication. You know, habits are economic. Imitating other people and their beliefs and views is economic. Um, there is uh, but on the other hand, if you want people to, uh, if you want uh, development projects to be adaptive, you're require you, you're going to be requiring them to invest a lot more in analysis, in data collection and analysis. And I think um, Owen has touched upon this already. And that's going to inquire, uh, require quite a lot of extra cost. And the question is, where is that money going to come from? Some people, uh, I think, will be familiar with a guy called James March. I think you might have mentioned him at some stage. Um, years ago, he talked about the tension between, in organisations between exploration and exploitation. It's much cheaper to exploit your existing knowledge and more expensive to explore and discover new knowledge. So if we do really want to move in this more adaptive and open approach, we're going to have to try and tweak that balance between exploitation and exploration in the organisations. And how we do that, I'm not exactly clear, partly because I'm only partly the way through Ben's book, <laughs> and I'm not 100% sure whether I haven't yet, the answer's there and I haven't yet found it. Um, but I think one thing that might be useful to do as we try and move in that direction is pay more attention to monitoring uh, the diversity of approaches that any given project has. And if a project is t seeming to take a singular approach, as Ben touched upon already in his presentation, this should be a warning sign that the balance is out of skew and that we should be uh, looking for the presence of diversity of practice. Um, I sort of uh, was quite sympathetic to Alison's uh, question about, you know, wh what, was, what is the cost of all this? Because I think an, an economic perspective on our cognitive behaviour is, is, is particularly relevant and, and, and the also the behaviour of organisations. And I think uh, also Owen mentioned about the, the importance of, um, of analysis and how, how that more analysis would be required. I think the last thing I'll just say was about, um, about who should be reading this. I think he left out one group, which are evaluators. I think evaluators <laughs> should be reading this book. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that point. Very good, thanks. Uh, John. Thank you, John Mitchell from Alnap. So here's one evaluator who has read Ben's book. Uh, great book it was too. It's just a, a, one reflection which I think will lead to uh, one, one question for Ben. I mean, reading the book and some of the examples in it, the, the, the Balinese rice farmers and so on, sort of made me reflect on what it was like when I started out in this business about 30 years ago, where you often had anthropologists on, on teams, on evaluation teams, who, in a sense, were, were put there to make sense of complex adapt adaptive systems at the local level. And I can certainly remember one um, 
example in southern Ethiopia where I was working with the uh, Barana tribe and it was a, we were looking at the Gadu system there which is a complex system of rights and obligations uh, to do with uh, routes to pasture and water. So there's an anthropologist on that team who really helped make sense of that. And I remember in those days, you used to get anthropologists on teams um, as, a, as a matter of routine. Yeah. In World Bank pro uh, projects too. I mean, I, I know that, in fact, I was employed as an yeah. anthropologist on, on a World Bank project looking at complex systems uh, al along the Bardari River. Oxfam, I know, in the old days wouldn't move in Somalia without con consulting Ian Lewis, who was an anthropologist. But I, I think those, those days have changed a little bit now, and there seems to be a gap. And I suppose my, my question for, for Ben is, is this, that when you get a great book like this coming out, when someone comes along with a new idea that's going to take hold, you often get agencies, uh, NGOs, who, who, who employ people to, to take care of it. And so. When, when ALNAP published its protection guide, which is something new in the humanitarian sector about uh, 10 years ago, agencies started to employ protection officers. And we get accountability advisors and learning advisors. And I just wondered if Ben thought that you were complexity going to see the emergence of the God. complexity advisors <laughs> <laughs> turning up I'll in, in NGOs. <laughs> I want that business card. <laughs> I'll leave now and I'll take my bet with me. I mean, <laughs> so, and if you are, Ben, is this going to happen? And if it does, is it a good idea? <laughs> Very good. Um, Claire, I think. Thank you. Um, Claire Malamed from ODI. This has been really interesting. I have to confess, I'm only about halfway through the book, so some of the questions I asked may be awaiting the final 120 pages that I haven't got to yet. But it struck me that, at least in the part of the book that I've read and in what, I just, what you've just said this evening, it might be worth thinking about this from the other way, that in some ways what Duncan says is, is right. You know, everyone knows the world is complicated. The world that they live in is complicated. The thing that they're confu they think is that the world of aid or the world that other people live in is somehow simpler than the world in which they operate <laughs> because everyone knows that their own world is quite complicated. <laughs> so what I think, what made me wonder sitting here was what are the reasons why people choose to think that the world in which they operate, the, the world at work, for example, you know, they go, they're at home and they understand that their family is complicated, but when they go to work, they sort of operate as if somehow things are simple. What are the incentives that are driving people to think that the world is simpler than it actually is? <laughs> I think in aid, at least, there are possibly two. One, of course, which we're very familiar with over the last few years is the need to communicate to the public is to try and tell a simple public story about aid that is based on these things work, therefore carry on paying your taxes to support it. So my first question is really, what's the public story here? How do we use, how does this translate into trying to get people to sort of care about this stuff and spend their, and be happy to spend their taxes on it? And the second thing is, how does this, I think another possible incentive for people to think that the world is simpler than it is is simply if you're, never having been in this position, I can't say, but I can imagine if you are in a position of trying to run a big organisation, you know, you understand you're dealing with massive complexity, but somehow you have to get out of bed in the morning and make a decision. So how does this, it seems to me there's a very strong incentive there for people to think that the world is simpler than it is, simply in order to just make sense of their everyday lives. So my question, the second question is, is this then all about decentralization? Is the answer to this just about make the unit smaller and therefore allow people to kind of be, you know, change the incentive so people are able to think more about simplicity, about complexity? Or is there some way of somehow handling big organizations and the kind of meta decisions that people <coughs> have to make through this lens as well? Because it strikes me this works very well for projects and for smaller units don't quite see this in bigger units very good thank you there's, there's a hand yes at the end of the, your row i think just pass it all the way and then oh you've got a microphone already oh very good speak <laughs> hi um my name's sophie stevens i work at pwc on diffid consultancy programs and particular focus on post-conflict security justice of governance space i had just quite a simple question for ben and maybe also owen Duncan mentioned that some of this um, thinking was perhaps already there in some niche areas, potentially including governance. 
And I wondered if you could comment on, you know, the emergence of use of political economy analysis, conflict analysis, drivers of change analysis that DFID has been using over the past couple of years. I think even mid 2000s, some of that stuff became more and more commonplace. You know, what do you do? You think those tools are useful in the light of this, and what what do you see as their future? Yeah. We got and then Lenny. I think you had your hand up. Uh, and then we'll go, we'll go round again then. So yes, le, 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 let's have it from Lenny. And then you're first in the next round. I, I'll try not to forget. Then we'll have six. We'll try and answer them. Lenny, go ahead. Thank you. Lenny Wild from ODI. Um, congratulations, Ben. It's great to see the book out. I'm also just beginning to read it and, and really looking forward to, to learning more. Um, I also had a question um, building on the points that Claire has raised around the implications for how we communicate aid to different publics. And I was involved in some work last year looking at public attitudes here in the UK to aid. And what was interesting was that actually we found that, you know, on the one hand, we know we've been communicating this, you know, a fairly linear, you know, simplistic model of what aid is, broken down into discrete parts very much in the way you describe. And it seemed to be doing you know, a couple of things. On the one hand, some of the, some of the citizens that we spoke to in different parts of the country seem to be rejecting aid because actually they see that that's not working. You know, you've said you'll give money and it will lead to lives saved or kids in school and that's not happening, so aid doesn't work. Or it was leading people to say, well, actually, we don't believe you. We don't think you've been very honest with us about what you're doing, and that's a problem. Um, um, but actually, at the same time, what was really interesting to me was that there was an appetite, and I think, you know, implicitly, people get that the world is much more complex. There's an, a lot of appetite to learn about how change really happens. So, sort of, what can we take from your work about that communication challenge? And as you were talking, actually, what I thought was we need to get much better at telling the stories, you know, whether it's the, the smallpox story, rather than describing all of the complexities and, and how do we get better at that. Very good. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go around again, but I think let's come back and answer these. And I'm going to allow emergence to okay. emerge and let you all answer whatever you want to answer. And if there are any you don't answer, I might nominate you to answer them. <laughs> so, Ben, you're looking as if you're ready to go. Don't answer them all. Okay. Um, on the question about failure, uh, this is actually a... This, this whole point about higher rates fail actually quite advantageous that Alison kind of answered it for me uh, um, when she talked about the World Bank experience in the 1990s. I, th I think there's a, there's a challenge about w what we actually see as failure, the, the, the metric or the yardstick we're using to analyse failure or success, uh, what, and how we then tell that story. And if we were actually honest about you know, moving away from project failure towards system failure, th the rates would be much higher. And I think we run the risk, uh, there's a Peter Cook joke that I quote in the book, that we've studied our mistakes long and hard and we're pretty sure we can repeat them exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I suspect that actually the, the, the actual failure rate of development projects is actually a lot higher if we're being really transparent Absolutely. about it. So let, let's, let's step back. Let's try and take a systemic view on failure. Let's try and move beyond this paradox that actually we're failing quite a lot of already, but we're, we won't do something different because we're saying, oh, actually, that will lead to higher rates of failure. If we're really transparent about failure, that should lead us to embrace adaptation and this pr uh, opportunity for failure. And I think, actually, it, it, it links up to the point about public communication, that if what we need is a better story for the, the public on the whole, we, they need and and they want a more sophisticated understanding of development. Part of that should be to say, well, some of these things are going to be predictable, reliable vaccine programs, and so on. Some of these things are going to be higher risk, and therefore most of the public would understand the idea that high risk, potentially high reward, but also potentially higher rates of failure. And I, th I think where the public understanding of development side of things actually falls falls down a little bit, um, in my eyes is that it seems to assume that it's the message that inculcates a belief in development or a belief in aid. And I don't actually think it is about that. I think that in this country, at least, people have their views on development and whether or not they believe in it. The messages may make them feel a bit disheartened about that belief, but they'll continue to believe in it. 
And there are other people that don't believe in it, and they'll use the negative stories to reinforce that belief. So actually, if what we want to do in that situation is avoid the feeling of trying to hide things, that's if we're ultimate, otherwise we get into the situation that I've observed in humanitarian aid, and this is where I've actually been engaged in kind of public understanding stuff, where you've got this sense that the humanitarian aid agency is actually trying to hide something even when they don't actually have anything to hide because they're being closed about the, the story, because they're presenting this image, you know, five quid will get you the, the, the blanket or the whatever it is. And, and I think, it, you know, let the sun shine in has to be the principle, really. And I, and I think the transparency question is a slightly different question to the complexity question. Uh, I, I think both need to be addressed. They don't necessarily need to be addressed at the same time, but I, I think it's actually uh, tantamount. If, if we're going to be transparent about what we do and why we do it, we need to be honest that actually a lot of aid money is already going to places where we don't know why, why we're doing it, we don't know how we're doing it, we don't know what we're going to achieve. That's already happening. So I don't think we can say, actually, because we're talking about complexity, suddenly it becomes harder to say, say that message or share that message. Um, on John's point, uh, I mean, that's a straw man question if ever there was one. Uh, and if that happens, you can shoot me now. Um, <laughs> but obviously, this is something that needs... It's a, it's a theory of change for all of these different areas that you're talking about. Actually, it's something that I think people should be thinking about or not, depending on the kind of problem that they face. Um, so yeah, so, and, and then the final point is just about this, this idea of exploration versus exploitation. I think there's actually more space for adaptation in our organisations and in, in, there's, more in, there's more money available for analysis. There's a huge amount of money being put in by donors to develop new programmes. I, I can give examples, but I won't. Um, where actually you can invest in different ways of doing that same analysis and it can be more effective. So I don't buy the idea that there, there isn't, you know, I agree there is a cost, but it can be supported because we're currently using a lot of money to do analysis of conventional types. And I think the adaptations point, I think it's about seeing where you are and seeing where the space of possibilities is. You know, mm. Evolution doesn't happen because a bird suddenly moves from being a small wingless creature to being a flying creature. <laughs> it moves through exploring the adjacent possibilities. What's, what's the next step that can get you closer to where you want to get to? And that's what I think we need to be exploring. That, that's what makes adaptation lower cost because actually you've already gone halfway there you're already in the space you've already got incentives that enable you to do that in some of your program it may not be all of it it may be that actually with 80 percent of your programming you need to be linear and predictable and it's only with 20 percent of what you do but actually at the moment we're not even having that conversation very good thanks a lot anybody want to pick up anything that hasn't been touched upon oh, I do, go on. okay let me I, I, I want to pick up three quick points. One is I'm fascinated that in this conversation people have been using the words complex, complicated, chaotic, uncertain, risky, random, all as if they're interchangeable words. And they're not. And there's a whole science of complexity that we owe it to ourselves and the people we're trying to serve to understand better. <coughs> And the fact that people are throwing around these words as if they all mean the same thing suggests that as a community, um, we are, um, we're doing a disservice to the people that we're trying to serve by not understanding them. They are, they are important in, they are different in very important ways. And they have important and knowable policy conclusions for what we should do differently if we understand the difference between a complicated problem and a complex problem or a chaotic problem. Those are different things. And so you should read Ben's book, which you can buy outside. Um, uh, I'm not on commission. The second <laughs> point, uh, but, uh, the drivers of change, Sophie's question. Um, uh, I, 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 to the extent that you think you're trying to influence or shape a complex adaptive system, I, I don't find the word complexity all that helpful. I think the, the important thing here is a complex adaptive system. That's, that's what there is a science th about. And if you're trying to, if you're trying to um, shape a complex adaptive system and you're trying to change its emergent properties, then I think it's unlikely you're going to be able to do that by doing deeper, longer, harder ex-ante analysis, right? You can have a room full of people doing a room full of, of whether it's econometrics or anthropology or anything else. You're not going to be able to, none of that is going to survive contact with reality. And actually what you need to do is do the analysis much more intensively afterwards. 
as you well, during and after, you need to be probing, sensing, and responding. That's the analysis. And somebody said that it, that might be quite expensive. Two things. One is that it's not as expensive as doing all that upfront analysis. That's a waste, largely a waste. And the other is that it is not as expensive as failure, which is uh, the main, the leading alternative. Um, so uh, I, I actually think we could dismantle quite a lot of the, um, uh, the the brigade of people who spend their time doing doing a lot of the upfront analysis and replace them <laughs> with better data analysis and. There are good examples, and they're in Ben's book, but there are also examples are in our own social policy, um, where you can make massive improvements, massive, massive improvements in the cost effectiveness of programs by using data well to adapt and evolve. And uh, if I may just give you an example, imagine that you were, imagine that you were an ambitious couple of dot commas who wanted to set up the world's biggest IT company. You had this vision of being Google, right? You wanted to. Um, really un organize the world's information, right? Would you draw up a plan for a big company with 30,000 people that would start on Monday morning with an organogram of who was going to do what and what products you were going to have on, on at the beginning? And that you, would you plan a big organization? Or would you start in a garage, build a search engine, and then grow and iterate and become the world's biggest? organization that manages the world's information. You would do the second of those, right? E if you want to take these solutions to scale, if you want to do world-changing things, you start small and you adapt and evolve. And it's amazing how big the changes are that you can bring about that way. Yeah. If you plan a big thing at scale, it will never work, right? And that is what we're trying to do in development. And I, I think it's a mistake. And then the third point. Um, how do we deal with failure? How do we manage, how do our aid organizations manage failure? My answer to that, uh, in part, is there, there are instruments that take the adaptation and the iteration and the learning outside the aid organization. One possible suggestion, I don't say it's an answer to all these problems, is development impact bonds, which you can read about on the Center for Global Development website. There are others, uh, other ideas are available. Uh, very good. Alison, you. Indicated you, want, in you want to, to say something. A pitch on dibs. Um, uh, uh, quite quickly, the, the if possible. Just, just reflection, though. I mean, My I salary think, um, the um, okay, great. the point that, that Owen just made about you know you wouldn't design Google from you know with Goss plan, I think is absolutely right. But it does raise the question, I think, whether you can get to where we want to be from where we are now with a lot of the agency infrastructure that we have in the system. And I oh. think. Oh, we can the kind of nuclear implication of this is that actually a lot of that has to be raised to the ground Amen. and we have to start again. Yeah. And we do need very different kinds of, of models of engagement. And you don't go that far in the book. You're sort of <coughs> kinder, you sort of step, fall, you fall short of that. But I think that is a potential implication which one would have to um, think through. Very good. Quick, quick thing on language. Um, I think Ben demonstrates how to talk about complexity. You do it through stories and that that's how you talk about aid. You don't need to say, for every $5, you'll, you'll get X. If you just say, aid has done these 20 different things, you can show the complexity and the, diff and, and the sort of randomness and the unpredictability of real life and make the case for aid. And I think, increasingly in Oxfam, I'm finding decent, intelligent, nuanced case studies are the way to communicate with staff, not these kind of sort of panoramic things. And I think Ben's use of case studies is brilliant. On language, I don't think if I go into Oxfam and say, hey guys, I'm here to talk about complex adaptive systems, I'm going to have many people in the room. Um, you have to actually, okay, the problem with complexity is that the word complexity attracts really weird sociopathic people who, <laughs> who love so the fact that it's complex, right? And that's fine for, you know, I'm sure you're all, well, presumably we're all like that because that's why we're here. But actually in terms of communication with normal people, I say things like messiness. Yeah? Um, and I've tried to boil it down to how do you describe this in, in Oxfam, and I say, how do you plan when you don't know what's going to happen? How do you campaign when you don't know what the solution is? And then you get sensible discussions. And some of the best discussions on complexity have been when no one has used the word complexity. And I think we need to think about the language we use. Very good. Thank you very much. We're, we're running out of time, but let's go around once more. Let's see if we can do this. Let's have four questions, and there are two already over there. 
See if you can ask a short, sharp question. See if you can nominate somebody from the panel who you would like to put on the spot. If you can't, I will afterwards. But we'll go round. Um, OK, there's one more over here. So there are two people waving their hands over there. I said you're... OK, there's two there and two there. Who were the two? This chap in the front with the black jumper. Um, <coughs> thank you. Um, I think one dimension that... So, uh, we need your name and your organisation. Oh, uh, your Benjamin Kemp, I'm just here on my own. Yeah. I'm, I'm not representing any organisation. OK. <coughs> um, one dimension that has not been mentioned in the discussions is the use of aid as a political tool. And I don't know whether you can um, uh, say something sorry, about that. Tool. Aid as a political tool. Political yeah. tool. OK, and you don't want to point that question at anybody in particular, we'll, we'll decide. Somebody else uh, at the back had their hand up? On the right hand side, no, maybe. <laughs> Gone? Okay, uh, two over here. Hi, um, I'm uh, side, okay. Kim Warren. I'm a, a recent uh, um, arrival in the development world. I've been working with Ben recently on some projects with, uh, with DFID, and I'm uh, president of the International System Dynamics Society which might give away what I'm about to say. Um, uh, we get a lot in the third part of, of Ben's book about kind of how important it is and how useful it will be if we understand complexity and start to grapple with it. But can I just make a, a kind of clarifying plea, really? Uh, it's a good thing to recognise that complexity is out there. It's a good thing to inspect it and to measure it. None of those things actually help you actually deal with it. Uh, and we do know from other fields how to deal with complexity. Yes. We've been doing it for decades. We use simulation. We use simulation. I don't mean pictures of things that look like flocking birds on a TV screen. I mean actual simulations that mimic the way the situation is actually working that you're trying to intervene with. And um, this is becoming possible in the managerial world. A friend of mine who works in the corporate world says we now have both the methodology and the technology to simulate all substantially important management decisions. And any, any chief executive who does not do so should go to jail. <laughs> very good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there was one over there. Hi. Um, I'm Maya Forstatter. Um, I haven't read the book, but I'm looking forward to the sequel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's going to be called Change on the Edge, um, because I think, you know, aid is kind of an old-fashioned thing. It describes one particular way of working to try and change much bigger systems. Um, it's, it's clearly part of the answer, but it's, um, you know, by, by defining it in terms of aid, you're already um, putting a boundary on the bit of the solution space that we can explore. Um, and I guess sustainable development on the edge probably would fall off the edge of the cover. Um, and <laughs> Uh, my, my point is, um, I, I think one of the most important things I heard was about what are the incentives and how do you make it pay? And I think there are people outside of Owen's four types of people. There are, you know, there are people in business who are feeling the same disjunction. There are people who are running pension funds. There are people who are, um, you know, trying to work out in governments in the north how we get off fossil fuels. There, you know, there are so many different organisations that are trying to work out how do we get from here to there and across that valley of death that doesn't meet anyone's institutional incentives. So I think that question about how, how you make it pay is really important. And to me, my kind of simple rule of thumb that I take is um, when organisations work with other kinds of organisations that have completely different incentives in, not in sort of mushy, friendly, happy partnerships, but in uncomfortable partnerships that change the incentives for the different kinds of, inf of institutions that allows, that allows them to explore, the explore a wider bit of the solution space without necessarily have to be, say the word complexity or be all wonky about it. It sort of forces them to do it. Sorry, that's not a question. Uh, the guest question is how do you make it pay? Very good, thanks a lot. And then uh, chap in the front here. Yeah, my name is um, Suleiman Ball. Um, I work for Slamco as um, strategic and policy, policy development um, um, executive. My question is, um, I simply want to contextualize this um, sounds of anarchy or 
this organization. Um, let me assume that um, I want to use your book to give an evidence to House of, the House of Lords on the basis of um, the UK aid right, to substantiate or to justify that the percentage you want to give to this organization, so-called NGOs, right, is justified. How could I use your book and persuade them that this organization or this group of organization which seems to be so disorganized, right, and in chaos, right, they can use this money, right, to achieve the goal they've set out, right, I mean, the budget for putting out, I mean, putting up such, I mean, such an amount. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, Kim, I don't, think you, I don't think you had a question. I think yours was more of a comment, and I'm sure people afterwards will want uh, links to all of these interesting things that we should be using or we're going to be shot. Or was it locked up, wasn't it? Not shot. Um, but I think we've got four questions. One of Claire's, which I think wasn't really answered first, uh, uh, first time around, is this all about decentralisation? Uh, so that's, uh, I would say, question number one. Uh, question number two, I think, is aid is essentially a political process, and I would add on a second part to that. Can this way of looking at it help... Uh, uh, in any way. Uh, the third one, I think, is, is how do you make it pay? And the fourth one, uh, which I think I'm going to uh, point at you, Ben, is how, could, how do you think your book might help Southern NGOs? So do you want to start with that one and we'll work our way back up through the others? Um, Quite quickly, if you uh, want to have time for a glass of wine. I that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, pick, pick well, another okay, one and your colleague can answer it. I guess there's a, there's, a, there's a basic issue, and I was actually here at ODI talking, presenting a report on uh, southern NGOs, and that's why I didn't want to talk to it because it would seem like I'm just pushing another thing that I've written. But I just have I've written a report which is about what southern NGOs can contribute to to international development. And what we actually identified there was some of the really challenging issues around complexity. That we didn't use the language of complexity. We talked about resilience and this idea of community resilience. And there's a big, big movement towards resilience and. A lot of international organisations which are essentially assuming that you can, as an international NGO, go into someone else's country and build their resilience. And it's, it's actually, slightly, you know, it's exactly what we didn't want to happen to this idea. It was supposed to be about changing the way that we think about development, changing the way that we think about uh, humanitarian work. Now, um, there's the, the point is that in order to build resilient communities, you need to understand the intricacies of people's lives. You need to build resilience in ways that aren't linear, that aren't, don't assume that just because you're uh, <coughs> vulnerable to floods that you need to build flood defences and that's going to solve the problem. It, actually, it may be about institutions, it may be about distribution of things. And there's a whole complexity to people's lives, the, the vulnerability that they're facing, the opportunities they face, that local organisations are much more able to, to navigate, to understand, because they're in there for the long term, not just during the disaster phase, but before the disaster, afterwards, they can smooth the curves between these kind of sharp <coughs> lines that we have in the system between development and humanitarian work. So I would say that if, if, if development work really is going to be attuned to the reality of people's lives, if it's going to enable them to be empowered to make decisions to guide their own development, then you should be fun funding southern NGOs because they're, they're more attuned to the reality, the complexity of, of those lives than international agencies ever can be. So that would be an argument. Whether, whether or not the House of Lords is willing to fund more NGOs on that basis and what you lose if you start putting more money through local organisations as opposed to international organisations, that's a separate conversation. But there, I think there is an angle that, where you can make a pitch. Alison, do you want to take one of these? Um, or something else? I actually think the question about aid and politics was, was you know, have we, is there any discussion around the use of aid for political ends, was that, that it was use of aid as a political tool. Mm. And I think um, actually there are some sort of references in, in, in Ben's book that would make, I think, quite interesting reading in the light. I mean, for me personally, I think it would be fair to say this is the conclusion I would draw from Ben's book, you know, pretty much all aid that is used for those purposes uh, doesn't produce the outcome you were hoping for, mm -hmm. and um, and and it's pretty much the wrong way to go about it. But of course, history is littered with cases like that. And in those first 120 pages or so, where Ben deconstructs all that is kind of fundamentally wrong <laughs> with the way in which aid is is both conceived and delivered, you know that that's certainly part of that. But we live in a in real world 
too, and one has to recognize that in many cases, aid continues to be used for political purposes. But I think um, the answer would be that um, it's not a good way to achieve good results for most people in development. Very good. Uh, thank you, Alison. Uh, Duncan, do you have a particular question or a different question you'd like to answer? I'm going to agree with uh, Myra a bit that actually this, this book isn't actually about aid. Um, it's about change. And um, it's kind of taking aid as an example of that. And it's, but it's actually much more relevant, much more widely relevant to anybody working on change and political change should be, re should be reading this book. Um, and so in terms of coming to the question of um, how, do you, how do you make it pay, I think, what do you mean by pay? If you mean by pay, how do you... Uh, shift power and politics to redistribute power towards those who don't have enough and toward then there's lots in this book about how to do that and I think that's much more interesting than how do we make aid pay or not pay aids kind of a dwindling issue really uh, in terms of development so uh, don't read this just to find out about aid read this to find out what comes next very good thank you and pass could you pass your microphone down to Owen so are you going to talk about decentralization or something else do you want me to talk about Well, I don't know. Claire, are you, do you want your question answered? <laughs> is this all about decentralisation? <laughs> I guess that's so why I, she asked it. No, <laughs> there you go. I, I, don't, I don't think it is all about decentralisation. I think what is, what is right is, is that um, testing and adapting um, is going to be easier to do on the ground. And this is consistent with our narrative about country-owned, context-specific local change building up to large-scale system change. So I think there is something about the notion that um, y to really understand how things work, you need, you, need to be, uh, you need to be on the ground monitoring and tracking and adapting and learning in the context in which you're working. So if, if that's what you mean by decentralization, then I think, I think there is a connection there. But if, when you come to this question of, you know, we want, we want to see um, faster economic growth, social and political change in developing countries. Now, I, I agree with Maya. I, mean, I think aid is a very peculiar to instrument to use if that's what we want to see. I think it's a shame that we're talking mainly about aid and not about illicit financial flows or trade policy or climate change or arms sales and security. These things shape the systems within, w within which evolutionary change happens in developing countries. And if we're serious about accelerating economic growth, rising prosperity, reductions in inequality, we need to be serious about those things. And it does seem to me the idea that you're going to come along with an aid project, an aid budget, and tweak some, you know, back a reformer who's going to lead their society to a, a different political settlement just seems to me to be, uh, you know, A, unlikely in theory, and B, as Alison said, you know, our experience hasn't been terribly good with that. And yet there are so many other things we could be doing to shape the system within which these systems are evolving and changing that we seem to neglect, right? And we, we can know things about what's likely to, to lead to beneficial emergent change. So, for example, having societies in which companies pay taxes to governments and are accountable to those governments seems like the kind of thing that would lead to the emergence of a social contract, more efficient, more effective, more accountable government, much more than running an aid project would, right? And that is a, that is a complexity way of thinking about this problem because it's about relationships within a society, within a community. It's, it's about the way the different agents interact with each other much more than it is about us coming along and, and bringing a solution to somebody else. And so if you're thinking in complexity terms, it seems to me you shouldn't be mainly thinking about aid. You should be mainly thinking about other things if what you're trying to do is bring about um, uh, wholesale systemic change in developing countries. Um, uh, just one point on how would you explain all this to the House of Lords. Very quickly. I ha very quickly. I haven't checked this number, but somebody told it to me the other day, and I'm going to tell it as if it's true. Um, apparently, if you add up all the aid we've ever spent... Um, as reported to the DAC, and you divide it by the number of lives that were saved just by the eradication of smallpox, then the cost per life saved is about $20,000. That is, if all the aid did nothing else, or if all the rest of it was wasted, if all the rest of it was burning it and, and putting it down a drain, you would still have a, uh, an intervention that would be cost-effective by the standards of the National Health Service today, right? Even if nothing else 
if you took all the aid and divided by the benefits of that one intervention, you would have a cost-effective intervention. Okay? So you, you only have to add in a few more other benefits of, that the aid program might have delivered over the years. That's how you sell this to the House of Lords. You don't go and tell them about complexity. You go and tell them about the good that the aid system has done. Very good. Um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm getting flashed at from the screen because I've been neglecting the online audience. I've got three questions here. Uh, Joe Lamport, communications advisor, Karana Corporation. Can the author give some concrete examples of how projects might be done differently, taking into account his ideas? Well, um, he should read the book, shouldn't he? Okay. <laughs> and, and do development impact So, problems. Joe, read the book. Uh, another one, um, uh, Matt uh, Collins from uh, the Centre for the Study of African Economies in Oxford. Can you give examples of projects which embraced complexity, which were then subsequently rigorously evaluated? Are these all empirically robust examples of success? He should read the book and then contact you if he wants to pick a fight, I think, Ben. Is I that right? That question is no, uh, I, I sense there's a fight coming. <laughs> okay, very good. So, Matt, do that. The, th the third one, I think it would be interesting to get a view in the room. Christina, a consultant of PwC London, how do you think donors would react to requests of funding for complex and uncertain aid programmes? Uh, do we have a donor in the room? <laughs> if not... I have a receiver. Okay. Um, <laughs> We've got quite good experience with this, with DFID, with the Swiss Development Agency. Uh, people in uh, the receiving end of aid always say, oh, we can't do that because the donors will say no. Actually, when you go to the donors and say, the situation's changed, would you like us to just carry on doing the same thing? They tend to say, actually, no, we'd quite like you to do something differently. Uh, th amazing, isn't it? So we can't use the donors as an excuse for an action or not thinking. Actually, donors are often out front. There was one situation where they gave us a million dollars uh, to try something innovative, and it was the Oxfam computer that said no, because it didn't, ha didn't have a whole set of outputs and outcomes. We couldn't actually accept the money for months <laughs> because we were so rigid in the way we looked at programs. Okay. Just come back. I'm just going to say I'm not going to sum up, so Ben, uh, I'm handing over the last word to you, um, and then afterwards we'll just have a round of applause. So you have the last word. Well, it depends what you say, of course. Um, gosh. Um, I was actually going to respond to the question from Matt Collins to say, you know, rigorous evaluation. We, I think we need to change part of the parameters of what we mean by rigorous. If you mean, has there been a randomised controlled trial of the interventions in this book? For some of them, yes. Not for all of them, but, but uh, as I say, we, uh, that would be the wrong tool to assess the effectiveness of this kind of project. And that's pretty much the argument that I make. Um, but maybe that's a conversation we can have um, offline, as it were, or uh, whatever the uh, version is of that, Matt. Um, I guess, uh, in summary, it's been, a, it's been a real slog getting this book out because it's a, <laughs> you know, I started working on it in uh, 2009. Um, but actually, John suggested the idea that turned into the book in a pub roof garden in 2003. Yeah. And not because I was too drunk to do anything about it, but it was at least two years before we started <laughs> we it. thinking about it. So it's been a, it's been a real journey. And um, I guess from my own personal perspective, it's just really nice that the journey has resulted in something that actually anyone wants to read at all. So <laughs> uh, my overwhelming feeling of finishing this book is actually one of relief. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I don't pretend to have any of the answers. And I say at one point in the book that we, uh, we in the aid sector should move from people that know the answers to being people that know what the questions are. And, and that's what I would essentially want to leave you with. That, 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 that's really what I try and do in the book, what I try and communicate, is, is a way of a asking questions, the right questions about the problems we face. And the answers may lead us in difficult places. I'm not professing to have all the answers, but uh, I think that's at least a good starting point. Very thank good. You. Ben, thank you very much indeed. Alison, uh, Duncan and Owen, thank you very much indeed. Let's give them a round of applause and get out. <laughs>